I hear a lot of incomplete information about Sjogren's every day in clinic. There's generally a poor understanding of what it is, but also how it affects people's lives. And I hear it from patients, but also doctors. If I could go doctor by doctor, educating them on the latest of Sjogren's, I would. But what I'd rather do is give you the skinny on how to approach it so you don't continue to think there's nothing you can do. Besides, your rheumatologist may not be the entire answer for this one. Today, we're diving into what Sjogren's is, why its management can feel like uncharted territory, and how you can navigate this uncertainty to find relief and answers. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz, and this is Connected Rheumatology. Let's get started. Sjogren's disease is an autoimmune condition that I often think of as a cousin to lupus. Like all autoimmune diseases, it stems from a hyperactive immune system that is turned on itself and attacks the body instead of protecting it. This leads to inflammation, which then causes a wide range of symptoms. Most people associate with dryness, dry eyes, dry mouth, and even dryness in less obvious places like the throat or the vagina. These symptoms occur because Sjogren's attacks the glands responsible for producing moisture, like the salivary and lacrimal glands. But Sjogren's is so much more than just dryness because remember, it's a systemic autoimmune condition, meaning it affects the entire body. For some, the disease can target the joints or other organs like the kidneys or muscles and cause inflammation similar to what we would see in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or myositis. For others, however, they may not have those serious problems, but then they still suffer from fatigue, brain fog, or even widespread body pain. You could line up 10 people with Sjogren's and each one would have a completely different set of symptoms. As you can imagine, this makes diagnosing and treating Sjogren's a unique challenge for everyone involved. This is why learning your flavor of Sjogren's is so vital. It will guide the care you seek out based on what you have going on. A diagnosis of Sjogren's is made, like all my other autoimmune diseases, through a combination of symptoms and lab tests. More specifically, do you have dry eyes or dry mouth? And do you have the anti-SSA or anti-SSB antibody? In cases where you have the right symptoms and the right lab test, a diagnosis can be easy. Of course, when we are talking about autoimmunity, things aren't always easy. So if you happen to not have those antibodies, you may be sent on a bit of a wild goose chase to find out what's going on. And I talk about that more here in this video about Sjogren's, which I recommend you watch next. But finding out if you have it, well, that should be the hard part, right? Once you have a diagnosis, it should be clear how to treat it, right? Well, not always, which then leads me to the current standard of care for Sjogren's. There are many aspects of Sjogren's that can make successful treatment challenging. First amongst them is many with ongoing symptoms like the brain fog, fatigue, and body pain will not have obvious signs of inflammation. And when I say obvious, I'm referring to signs of inflammation that we can see with our eyeballs, meaning on your physical exam, or in your blood work. This won't be the case for everyone. In fact, some with Sjogren's will have many signs of inflammation. And in cases like those, we can pull out our trunk of immune system targeted medications and really go at it but many, many people with Sjogren's don't fit into that category. On one hand, it's actually a great thing. It means that your joints, your kidneys, your muscles, or really any other organs aren't being threatened. So it's like, yay. On the other hand, however, it means that my trunk of immune system targeted meds don't do much for your fatigue, your brain fog, or your body pain. For years, rheumatologists, including me, leaned heavily on hydroxychloroquine, a medication that we use successfully in things like lupus, and a lot of other autoimmune diseases. But then research came out early in my career, actually, that showed that hydroxychloroquine isn't particularly effective for Sjogren's symptoms. It showed us that when we used hydroxychloroquine, we were largely treating ourselves more than the patients. This is important for us to know because we obviously don't want to be using a medication that doesn't work and exposing the person to the potential side effects. But 
but it also left us with a bit of a void. It has now become standard for those with Sjogren's who don't have obvious signs of inflammation to focus their treatments on addressing the symptoms of dryness with eye drops and saliva production strategies and having them come back every six months, largely to make sure nothing has changed and to do a thorough lymph node exam because we know that having Sjogren's carries an increased risk of lymphoma. This may spare those with Sjogren's the exposure to a drug that doesn't do anything, but then it doesn't do much to address the body pain, fatigue, and brain fog, and it's just a frustrating reality. Many patients leave the rheumatologist office feeling like their most debilitating symptoms are being overlooked. There is, however, something that can be done, but it requires us to use a different approach. Research is now suggesting what I have seen in clinic for years, that these more vague but still life-changing symptoms might be more closely linked to the hypersensitive nervous system we see in fibromyalgia than the joint pain we see in RA or lupus. This now opens the door to a whole different set of tools that can actually be helpful. Now, the tools in this toolbox are far from perfect, but they are worth investigating and discussing with your doctor. They are medications that we would typically associate with fibromyalgia in that they go after pain and fatigue through neurologic mechanisms as opposed to treating and targeting the immune system directly. And the reality is that these medications are likely having an effect on our immune system that we just aren't smart enough to understand yet because the nervous system and the immune system are connected after all. I'm talking about medications like duloxetine, pregabalin, and even off-label use of meds like amitriptyline and low-dose naltrexone. Each has their own pros and cons, and which would be best to help you is based on a slew of factors that you'll need to talk with your doctor about. But my point being is these meds are not meds your rheumatologist may classically think of as being in the Sjogren's arsenal, but for many should absolutely be considered. It may require getting over any stigma you or your doctor may have regarding the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And honestly, aren't we over the whole fibro isn't real thing yet? And broadening our view on what is happening doesn't just open us up to different pharmaceutical tools, but should also help us reiterate the importance of supportive anti-inflammatory lifestyle changes. Those meds I mentioned are options and they can help, but they are not perfect. And the best results are found when people develop a plan that incorporates both medications and diet and lifestyle changes. I'm talking about things like an anti-inflammatory diet that's low on processed foods and sugar and high in omega-3 and leafy green vegetables. We're talking about a regular movement routine that gets your heart pumping and your muscles working. We want regular, restful, and restorative sleep, at least seven to nine hours a night that leave you feeling refreshed in the mornings. And we cannot forget about stress management. The effect of stress on our nervous and immune systems can be like adding fuel to the autoimmune fire. We all live in this modern world, which our bodies interpret as stress around every corner. So it really is about management of that stress. Ask yourself, what do you do every day that helps you manage it? And then closely tied to stress management, who are you surrounding yourself with? The community or lack of community we have around us influences our body systems in ways that are either supportive or detrimental. These lifestyle changes are important for everyone, honestly, but they take on a new meaning of importance when you have an autoimmune condition, especially when you have an autoimmune condition with limited treatment options. But here's the thing, not every rheumatologist is equipped to guide you through these lifestyle changes. This is where you may need to seek help from outside your doctor's office, which I know may sound controversial and like blasphemy coming from a doctor's mouth, but it's the truth. Medical doctors are not the best at helping you, one, identify which of these lifestyle areas you should focus on, and two, how to actually make meaningful change. I mean, if you got a peek at a lot of how your doctors are living their lives, they wouldn't really be the ones I'd ask for advice on stress management. My only word of caution here is to use common sense and critical thinking. Separate the advice or the program that you're looking into from the marketing. I'm not suggesting that you should seek help 
outside of your doctor's office because I think that the claims out there to provide a cure or to reverse or to get to the root cause of your Sjogren's are necessarily true. But because I am aware of the limitations of your doctor's office and the benefit you gain from making common sense anti-inflammatory lifestyle changes. Sjogren's disease is more than just dryness. It's a complex and often misunderstood condition. While traditional treatments have their limitations, there are ways to address the full spectrum of symptoms from fatigue to brain fog to pain. If you feel like you've hit a dead end with your current care, it's time to think differently. Neurologically focused treatments, lifestyle changes, and even guidance from other professionals can offer relief. My mission is to give you the information you need to make the best healthcare decisions for you. So if that's something that you're into, it really helps if you can subscribe to the channel and like and share this video. If you want to learn more about Sjogren's, I suggest watching this video next. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.